Are you ready, Mandy? Recording in progress. Yeah. There go. go. Okay. So on behalf of the HEADS Consortium Board of Directors, I would like you to welcome to our 2024 Best Practices Showcase to celebrate technology innovation for Hispanic success in higher education. I am Dr. Albert Troche, and I will be presenting the speakers for the concurrent session of this room. Before we begin, we request your support with the following. Please change your mobile phone to silent mode to have your full attention and avoid interruptions. The session is being recorded. This presentation will be in English. Finally, our staff will pass the QR code to all participants to complete the electronic evaluation for the session before you leave the room. You can also find the QR code on your name badge. Your feedback and recommendations are very important to heads. Now we're ready to start. This concurrent session is under the track of access. The title of this presentation is Building Community for Online Students via Social Media. And Mandy Taylor from California State University in San Bernardino will be our speaker. Go ahead. Thank you. Hello. My name is Mandy Taylor. I am an instructional designer at California State University, San Bernardino. I'm in the Department of Instructional Design and Technologies, or IDADS. Um, today, I will be talking about building community for online doctoral students via social media. I will be using my experiences and those of my cohort as current online doctoral students at Boise State University to help illustrate some of what I have found in the literature. My goal is to encourage faculty and administrators of online courses and programs to likewise encourage your students to build community spaces, um, sorry, to encourage your, your students to build community spaces together. Such community spaces for students by students contribute to a sense of well-being, belonging, persistence in a program, and higher rates of perceived learning. So before I dive in to what I've found in my experiences, a brief overview of what I'll be discussing. First, I'll talk about what the project entails, and then I'll discuss my positionality as a researcher and how that affects how and why I'm doing what I'm doing today. I'll also talk through some of the literature that undergirds my project, followed by some personal experiences, which may include those of my cohort mates. I have permission to share experiences um, as long as they are done anonymously. Finally, I will bring all of what I talk about back to retention and persistence for all students, not just doctoral students. So why this all matters. My primary research question um, or this project for this project is how and why do online doctoral students use social media to build community? To answer this question, I decided to use an admittedly loose autoethnographic approach. Reflecting on my personal experiences allows me to better understand and illustrate different facets of being a student, and especially an online student, and specifically an online doctoral student. While my experiences are not necessarily generalizable and should not be, personal experience is often lost in large data sets and has a place in research. Similarly, focusing on a small group of students in a single doctoral program in a single university in the United States is not and should not be generalizable. However, the results can be used locally in my particular program, and the lessons learned can be applied more generally, although the implementation of those lessons can vary based on a variety of factors. So why this project? I am an instructional designer by current vocation. And as designers, my team and I often emphasize the importance of designing interactive courses. Um, students need to interact with each other, with their instructors, and with the content um, in the course. In online courses, especially fully asynchronous online courses, interaction between students and interaction between students is often required via graded discussion boards and/or collaborative projects. Thus. <clears throat> Thus, interaction is performative and transactional. Students rarely build genuine communities and spaces they didn't create. Um, I'm basing this on my experience as a student as well as when I was teaching, which I'll talk about a little bit more, um, that the interactions with students um, are very much transactions. Like, oh, you said this, I agree, let me tell you how I felt. And, oh, you agree with me too. And so it was very stilted and not necessarily genuine. 
So I wanted to look at how doctoral students use or create online spaces to, create, to build community outside the purview of faculty and administrators, because I built such a space for my cohort at Boise State. I also wanted to take the opportunity to reflect on my experiences as an online student to kind of make sense of my experience and kind of see where I am and where I've been in my program, and possibly how being part of an online community has affected um, my doctoral journey um, versus when I was initially admitted into the program, I was like, I'm just gonna go into the program and do what I need to do. I don't need anybody, so to speak. But let me step back first a moment and tell you more about myself and how I came to my doctoral journey. Um, all of this contributes to how I approach this project and how I'm thinking through um, this. Um, this project is still a bit of a work in progress, so I am telling you kind of what I've found um, so far. Professionally, I am currently an instructional designer in higher education. Prior to becoming an instructional designer, I was a college level English instructor. For about 10 years, I'm at a variety of institutions in California. I taught primarily English composition courses, um, as well as ch children's and young adult literature courses. I was also a writing tutor. Um, outside of academia, I worked in the freight industry, I was a tax preparer, and I also worked in the medical industry. Educationally, I have a bachelor's degree in English. Uh, the program was traditional face-to-face -face program. I also completed independent study courses, and those courses, when I took them, were actual correspondence courses in which I would physically mail in my assignments and receive packets back from my instructors with feedback and grades. Um, since I've completed that program, um, those courses have been transitioned to fully asynchronous online courses. I also have a master's degree in English composition, rhetoric, and literature. This is a traditional face-to-face -face program, so I am comfortable in face-to-face -face modality. I also have a master's degree in instructional design and technology. This, that master's program was fully asynchronous online, 100% online. I did not go to campus until I graduated from that program. Um, any synchronous meetings were done via Zoom or other video conference, um, or with other video conference tools. And synchronous meetings were not required at all. I'm also currently pursuing my um, doctorate degree in educational technology at Boise State University. It is an asynchronous online program, fully asynchronous, um, and 90, well, 99.5% asynchronous. So I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So each modality builds community differently. So in my face-to-face -face programs, community was kind of given in that you're in a classroom space together and you kind of come to know each other's habits in that particular class space. And you kind of make friends or colleagues kind of based on where you sit in the classroom. In the eight online programs, you have to seek out community if you want it. Um, yes, you might be put into groups, you might be given discussion boards, but to have more authentic community experiences, you need to find them. And so spending time kind of thinking about how important community is in general, especially for retention purposes, um, I wanted to think through my experiences, both with my master's and now my doctorate degree, um, is an online program and what that means. And kind of, so that's kind of where I am, coming from a fully asynchronous online master's program into a fully asynchronous doctorate program um, and knowing that community helped me get through my master's program and it was vital because we kind of, we cheered each other on, we made sure we were all up to date with assignments and things like that, but it also did take a lot of time to interact with other people. And if I felt responsible for the group that I was in because I took over managing um, that correspondence, like, okay guys, we're in week five of this semester, so here's what to do this week. And that took a lot of time and organization that I didn't know if I wanted to spend 
that time again in a doctoral program trying to keep everybody on task? And was it really my job to do that? I had a lot of other life things happening when I started my doctoral program and I just wanted to get done. So a little bit about the doctoral program that I'm in. <clears throat> Excuse me, one second. Excuse me. So Boise State, this program is 100% online, asynchronous. It is quasi-cohorted. And by quasi-cohort, I mean that students are admitted once a year. We all start in the fall. We are required to take at least one class together, which is EdTech 601, which is Intro to Doctoral Studies. And that's specific to Boise State Doctoral Studies, as well as a OK, you're in a doctoral program now, and doctoral programs are much different than master's programs. Um, and we have to take that class in the first semester. We also are required to take a one credit seminar, EdTech 698, together for the first four semesters of the program. The 698 course is designed to help with community building um, and to help us um, under kind of make relationships and form those connections with each other as well as the faculty who are um, in that course or in teaching or administering that course. And the faculty rotate every semester. So it's not the same two faculty members um, each time. So they will rotate so we get to experience and hear from um, other faculty throughout the program. This particular program takes 3.5 to five years to completion on average. Um, however, this program does accept transfer credits and those transfer credits or summer courses can, will help you meet that three and a half year time to completion um, as desired. Also transfer credits um, will determine our path through the program after the first semester. So <clears throat> this is part of the quasi cohort that even though we start with one class together, there's not a lockstep progression from one class or set of classes to the next set of classes. This was a change from my master's program, which was fully cohorted, that we moved from one set of classes to the next set of classes together, assuming we passed the course, um, and that there was, was no deviation from the program or course flow. As mentioned, this program is 100% online asynchronous. Um, I would amend that to maybe 99.5% um, asynchronous. And there are some synchronous requirements in 698. We are required to attend at least three synchronous sessions. Um, there are a variety of sessions um, in the course. There may be some doctoral, um, doctoral dif dissertation defenses that we should attend other research talks um, by former students or other faculty in the program. And we also have collective advising sessions about a variety of topics um, throughout the semester. So that kind of also helps to build the community. But the community in those courses are also observed or surveilled or artificially created by instructors. Um, in our 601 pro, pro, I'm sorry, I'm out of words. In our 601 class, um, the instructor is one of the program co-directors. And in that course, he's told us flat out to make a student space for students by students, build community, work together, and that you need each other. And so though, although I was set on not actively creating community, or it's like I can get through a doctoral program alone, I changed my mind really quickly because once he said we should do that, I'm like, yeah, you know, we really should. Um, and so I waited for somebody to create the space for us. And nobody did. So we're three weeks into the course, the first course in our first semester in fall 2022. And we don't have a space and we need one. So I made a space. Excuse me. So I built a space in Slack. It's a Slack workspace specific to our cohort. We have had anywhere from 12 to 15 members since inception of this Slack space. 
Um, this is not an, our entire cohort either. Our admitted cohort was about 25 people in fall 2022. Um, not everybody has chosen to join the Slack space, which is totally fine. Um, it is possible for students um, to go through doctoral programs without um, making those connections, or they make connections in other ways. Just because they're not in our Slack group doesn't mean that they're not getting community elsewhere. Um, so our community kind of varies in the Slack space. Um, sometimes we add people for specific courses, and then they tend to stay. Um, it just kind of depends on who's active at one time. You can see here a list of the channels in our Slack group. Um, we have a channel per course each semester, except for 698, because that's kind of the same every semester. So we just have one for 698. The channels that are most active or used most frequently are the general channel, the random channel, and then the course-specific channels, depending on the semester. Activity tends to spike the week or two before classes start and then stays high the first week or two after classes start. Then we drop off <clears throat> and kind of work through our course material as needed and then pop in for specific questions as we come to them. There's another spike about midterm time or whenever a big project is due. And we have another spike at the end of the semester as we frantically try to finish um, our final projects and get feedback and just kind of assure each other that we're still here, that we're going to make it, and that we're almost done, just hang in there a little bit longer. <clears throat> okay. So the literature about building community <clears throat> and student persistence, excuse me, is full of, yes, community is required or not required, but community is highly recommended, especially for doctoral students. But at any level of studenthood, community is necessary. <clears throat> Lively et al. state that a sense of community in an EDD program is not happenstance. Instead, it is intentionally planned and cultivated in a variety of ways. So in my experience, we have the intentional Slack space also, in my experience, um, I've branched out to different social media places like Facebook and Instagram, <clears throat> X, which was Twitter. I'm not on that as much, but there is space there as well. That in for doctoral students, because we have so much other life stuff happening, and not that all students don't have life happening, but doctoral students, <clears throat> especially online doctoral students, have a variety of things on our plates. We have life, we have work, we have family, we have faith communities, we have all sorts of things happening. And the doctoral program adds to that pressure a little bit. So finding community or building a community of like-minded people going through similar um, experiences is crucial and vital. Um, it's something you need to, we need to seek out and something that you participate in or I have participated in as much as I need it. So some groups are for complaining, some groups are for support, for support some groups are for academic um, help. It just kind of depends on what I need at the time. Studebaker and Curtis in 2021 state that for doctoral students, opportunities to engage and learn from their fellow students reduces reduce the feeling of isolation. And isolation can be soul crushing um, in a doctoral program. Um, the longer I've been in the program and the more I see um, life happening to myself and my colleagues, friends in my community, um, the more we need each other. And without fail, if somebody in my group has a question, either about an assignment or about a way to navigate through our program with requirements and things that are happening, somebody has an answer. We can always refer back to either program material or um, other sources to help us answer those questions. Somebody is out there to help. 
Um, it's also just good to know that somebody is out there, generally speaking. And in our particular Slack group, we cross multiple time zones. So if I'm up at 3 a.m. Pacific time, my colleagues on the East Coast are probably awake too, and so they, they will answer my question if I have it. Also with time zones, I've missed entire conversations between my East Coast or Eastern time zone um, friends because I'm still asleep when they're happening. So it's interesting and kind of fun to go through those conversations as well. Barry argues that academically, community is associated with an increased likelihood of persistence. If we have a community, if we have people that we're working with that are going through the program with us, we are more likely to stay in the program. If life happens, things may require us to drop out for other reasons, for whatever reason they might be. But if we have a community, the chances are lower of us just dropping out and drifting away. Barry also says that a sense of community can act as a buffer against feelings of stress, anxiety, isolation, and burnout. I've seen this in my own experience. I've seen this in conversations with my colleagues. I have seen this in the Facebook groups that I'm in for graduate students. <clears throat> that there's a place to go and talk about all of these things to just kind of like, OK, I had this kind of day in my program. Am I alone in thinking this way? And it also, without fail, there's a lot of people chiming in that, no, this is not unusual. Oh, yeah, that happens to me today, too. And just kind of stories of affirmation that you're not alone in this process, that even though our programs may differ, that the community is still there. There's, this, there's a space for all of this. If you're stressed, if you're anxious, if you're feeling alone, you can go to a group that can help you with that. You also, if I'm a member of multiple groups, so I do have to choose carefully which group I go to because some, some groups are kind of the dark humor of graduate school. And so that's not always uplifting. It can be funny and kind of, oh yeah, that's exactly what's happening. But it's not always going to be good or helpful or uplifting necessarily. So if you're looking for places to be uplifted, go find the places that are full of positive support and that will actually help you through some of those things. And this is also not to say that professional help might not be necessary. Um, if professional intervention is needed for mental illness or other issues, then that, that may be appropriate. Um, we're not all trained to help with this. Um, so we're just kind of in this together and um, I have seen in some of my groups and have experienced personally the need for um, professional um, intervention um, in going through a program. Just kind of making sense of what's happening and making sure that we're all taken care of. So that community is important. Having it is vital. Barry also says that online doctoral students are sustained mostly by their experiences with peers. This does not discount the need for good advisors or good administrators in a program. But for by and large, especially in online courses, um, I'm going to interact with my colleagues and peers more than I interact with my advisor or instructor. Um, we are the ones doing the work and we are the ones making our way through the assignments. So I am likely to reach out to a peer first and then go to um, my instructor. Um, from a teacher point, an instructor point of view, when I was teaching, this was often the case. Um, no matter the modality, um, even in my face-to-face -face classes, if students were doing group work and I would monitor, kind of walk through the course or the class, um, they would be talking amongst themselves and asking each other questions about the assignment, even though I was standing right beside them. And so, um, I would kind of wait for them to realize that I was there, and if they didn't, then I would speak up and say, maybe you can ask me since I'm here. I can tell you what I meant, kind of thing. But we're likely to reach out to those, of us, to those around us and in the same position before we go to a higher authority, so to speak. 
But finally, from the literature, Britt talks about how a sense of community affects student engagement and perceived learning, and social involvement can make a positive impact on students' decisions to remain enrolled. Again, community affecting retention. So it's important for students to have this community to talk through or to just be part of um, the experience together. Um, so let me talk a little bit more about my specific experiences with the groups that I'm in. So before I talk about my groups, a meme from one of the groups that I'm in, I'm talking about, um, this is specific to dissertation, but it can also apply to conference presentation, um, preparation, or journal article preparation, any type of writing preparation. It's like, I wrote a page, be honest. Okay, I wrote a paragraph, be honest. I opened the document and took a nap. Thank you. That, you know, just this, um, and I, I relate to this on multiple levels. Um, I'm not quite at dissertation stage, but I am at dissertation preparation stage. And so as much as I love academic writing at times, I hate academic writing at times. So it can be like pulling teeth for me sometimes. And so sometimes just getting the document open and having it on my workspace is the accomplishment and naps are the reward. But the groups that I am in um, all help me to some degree. So graduate work, doctoral work especially, is not for the faint of heart. It is isolating. It requires discipline, endurance, patience, sacrifice, and a sense of humor. Social media groups and communities have helped mitigate my feelings of isolation. Sometimes you just have to talk to someone who knows what you're going through. For me, Facebook and Instagram groups have been vital to helping me find humor in the process. Um, the memes such as this one and others that I've seen in my groups um, help me cope. Humor is one way that I get through difficult things. And sometimes the darker the humor, the better. Sometimes the lighter the humor, the better. It just depends. Some of the groups I'm in are for advice. Some are for complaining. Some are solely for memes, such as the one on the slide. One group that I am in takes time weekly for us to celebrate our graduate student wins, no matter how small. Sometimes a win is as simple as writing a page or a paragraph or not quitting the program that week. Along with my Slack workspace, I joined the Boise State 2021 cohorts discord group in my second semester of my program. Due to my trans, I have transfer credits, so I was able to take some classes out of sequence, so to speak. At the time I joined the Discord group, the 2021 cohort were the venerable year two students and had more experience with the program. I read all of the chats from all of their previous classes to help get a sense of what they had gone through and also to get to know them. I was taking a class with some of um, the 2021 cohort members and I wanted to know more about them and to be with them. I learned more about how the program worked, how to get through specific classes, which classes to potentially avoid if I could, or which instructors I needed to interact with in different ways. Um, I also learned more about how to interact with my advisor. Um, as I am now a year two, the 21 cohorts space is still valuable to me as they share experiences with comp exam and dissertation preparation. So I'm still learning from the cohort in front of me. Our cohort and Slack group have lost members to general attrition and life circumstances. One classmate who had to leave for health reasons said that she would miss the community we had built the most and that it would be hard for her to find again or to replicate. Although we reassured her that she was always welcome in our group, she said it wouldn't quite be the same because she's not going through it with us, even though she's looking at another doctoral program um, that might fit her needs better, um, it's, she's not going through the exact same program with us, so it's not quite the same. There is something to be said for the camaraderie of shared classes. As I've taken classes out of sequence and forged my own path through the program, I have missed that shared experience. I stand outside of some of the Slack um, specific um, course specific channels, and I read what ha what's happening in them because I'm part of the whole Slack group but I can't really add to the conversation because I'm not in the class. 
And it always, it sometimes feels like if I do contribute to those conversations that it's as an outsider, well, it is as an outsider because I'm not in the class, but also that I'm, I might be coming across as though, well, this is what you should do because Mandy said so. And that's, that's not how I want to come across in the community. Um, I have, I can sympathize with issues in those courses, but not, but not really empathize or help solve problems. Interestingly, a couple of my classmates have commented on anticipatory grief at losing our community once we are all concentrating in our dissert dissertations and or have graduated. So what happens to our Slack space um, is something that I hope to collectively decide amongst those who actively participate in it now. Um, we use the free version of Slack. so. We might keep it open. We might change to a different way of communication. We're not sure. We haven't had that conversation yet. But there is some, a little bit of anxiety about losing that space. Like when I'm no longer in the midst or the throes of doctoral work, what do I do with this space? What happens to these relationships? Um, and this is something to consider um, as as I think about the answers to my research question and as I think about how this all ties into general discussions of retention of students in general, not just doctoral students, <clears throat> um, I sometimes have more questions than answers. But for my particular question for this project or this project in progress was how and why do online doctoral students build community via social media? So the how is fairly simple. We create those spaces for students by students. We can join existing spaces on Facebook, Instagram, Slack, and Discord. Facebook um, groups, it just depends on which kind of group. Um, Boise State has a Facebook group for students, but there's also faculty and program directors in that space. So it's not a for students by students space. <clears throat> Why we build community via social media. Social media is part of our lives now. It's more immediate than email. Excuse me, one moment. It's more immediate than email. We have um, social, it's for me, I preferred a social media space versus a big group text, because in social media spaces, you can um, encapsulate conversations. Like in Slack, we have specific channels for specific types of conversations. So it's easier to organize and stay in <clears throat> kind of in touch with what's happening in the conversation. Whereas big group texts, um, you don't really get the thread or kind of see how everything connects. Why? We build community via social media. We want academic connection and help. We seek programmatic advice. We just want the social connection. Doctoral work is hard and isolating. We also want positive and uplifting safe spaces. Um, I asked my cohort members um, in the Slack space to, talk, to tell me a little bit about why they joined the Slack space. And overwhelmingly, the answer was I just needed somebody to be able to talk to them. I just wanted a space where I knew where I could go to get help, to ask questions, to be uplifted, to have people help me know that I can get through this, to help know that I'm not alone. And so um, as much work as I feel that it is to kind of administer the Slack space and I feel responsible to respond to a lot of what's happening in the Slack space, um, which I've learned I don't have to because there are enough of us to answer all the questions so it doesn't have to be me all the time. Um, that that's the space is very valuable to me as well. And as I would tell my students, if one of you has a question, probably more than one person has that same, same question I liken that to if I'm feeling the value of a community space, chances are more than one person is feeling that way as well. So why this all matters. Online students come to the table as part of already existing complex 
social networks that can be both a help and a hindrance to doctoral study. We are all in multiple communities all at once, and they have competing interests sometimes. There's only so much time in a day, and there's only so much that can get done at once. So for online students, community helps provide a solid sense of belonging, which can affect retention rates positively. So if students feel that they belong to the program, to the community, the, the more likely they are to persist. Just some recommendations for administrators and faculty in online programs. Encourage students to build community spaces or to find community spaces. As much as they may not think that it matters, it does. Um, or have them think through reasons why they may not attend or be part of social media communities. One may be time and other commitments. One may be they just don't like social media. Other reasons people don't join is they feel they have enough um, in the class uh, spaces, that they don't need something extra or beyond um, what is given in the program already. But some just don't want to. It's like, I can get through this program by myself. Um, I'll reach out to the people I know can answer my questions if and when I have those questions. Other things that administrators and faculty can do. Ensure program and course materials and requirements are easy to find and follow. Um, a lot of the questions in my Slack space is, are about what instructors and program directors are asking us to do. It's not always clear what we're supposed to do. Um, and so easier it is for us, for the students to understand what is required of us, the easier it is to stay in the program in some respects because there may be uh, something that we missed in the requirements or that was not made clear or that a procedure was not made clear. Um, my particular program is going through some programmatic changes um, as we uh, go through the program. So that is kind of a, a sore spot for some. The changes will be beneficial for cohorts that come after mine, but it's throwing our, my cohort into some a bit of existential chaos because we're not quite sure what we're supposed to do. And so that can affect people's decisions to stay in the program. And another thing that another recommendation is for faculty and administrators to actively solicit and incorporate feedback from students in program design as well as course design. Um, I know that course design is usually easier to implement, implement than programmatic design. Programmatic design takes a lot of time um, and can be slow for good reasons. Um, but if there is consistent feedback about ways that courses or programs can be improved um, with consistent and concrete examples or constructive examples of ways things can be improved, um, take those into consideration. Um, at the very least, acknowledge them, that those suggestions have been made um, and that you know, feedback is still welcome. Even if things can't change or won't change for particular reasons, um, at least students know that they are being heard. So as I said very at the beginning, this is still a work in progress project. So some of these um, recommendations and why these things matter are still a little bit uh, up in the air for me. This is something that I probably hope to continue to think about, um, especially as I progress in my program and as I think about returning back to the classroom to potentially teach again, um, how I might encourage students to build community in spaces that I don't monitor. So that is the conclusion of my presentation this morning, afternoon. Um, the references, I'd be happy to take any questions if there are, I know we have plenty of time. Um, so thank you for your time and attention today. Is there any questions from the public here? We're fine? Okay, so make sure you fill the evaluation form. It's right here on the, on the name batch so we can have the, 
the briefing and the feedback for this course. So thank you for your participation in the session. Thank you, Mandy Taylor, for this great um, presentation and for sharing. Let's give it a round of applause. Very interesting project. Thank you for your Mandy. <laughs> thank you for your participation in the sessions and for sharing your feedback. Your recommendations are very important for heads. We invite you to participate in further sessions. This is the last one. So since it's the last session of the day. Please complete the general evaluation as well. So there's two evaluations that we need to help us fill in. So good afternoon, and on behalf of HETS, thank you for attending its 2024 Bets Practices Showcase. So we invite you to just stay at the lobby. We have our reception, so we can share some stuff there. Thank you. <laughs>